I want to welcome you not just to this webinar here today, but I want to welcome you to the new era of building communities. And this era is going to change the strategies for your community as well. I think it won't be a surprise to anyone here that around a year ago in February 2020, things went a little bit crazy. I think we all saw, um, not just in terms of what is else, what's going on around the world with the pandemic, but if you were following the data of online communities, if you're looking at how many people were participating and how many people were engaging, you might have noticed something really interesting, which is depending upon what kind of organization you're working with or what kind of community you're developing, your stats either went really, really high or they plummeted. And we were looking at this um, for a long time. We've been tracking the data of a lot of different kinds of online communities because I had this suspicion that when a lot of people managing communities were speaking about their communities at events, that when they were describing how many people were engaged and participating, I felt they were using what um, Winston Churchill might describe as terminological inexactitudes, or what we would better describe as lies or fibs would be a nice way of saying it. And when we began tracking the data, we noticed that a lot of communities didn't have anywhere near the level of participation that they were pretending to have. But when the pandemic struck, something interesting happened. What do you think that was? Do you think the statistics of engagement went really high or went really low? What do you think happened? You can put your answer in the chat box. What do we have? A lot of people think they went high. Okay, almost everyone thinks they went high. <laughs> a couple of people think they went low. <laughs> so overall, and it varied a lot by different kinds of communities, this is what we saw. That yes, there was a big site, big uh, spike when the pandemic hit. And we saw beginning around March, the level of participation in a lot of communities by the number of posts and the number of users suddenly went really, really high. But what we've seen since then is that this generally didn't last. The pandemic spike didn't tend to last over the long term. And it's kind of around now settling back down to what it was before. There are some really interesting things going on. You can see at the end that there's a spike in the number of media and posts but generally it's returning back to the baseline. So I think for most communities, engagement did spike, but it's going back to where it was before. But what did happen, and what we're seeing visible signs of almost everywhere we look, is that, and I know this is a cliche to say at this point, but the pandemic has accelerated five major forces which were already underway before the pandemic hit. And what I think some of you are seeing already, and definitely I'm seeing in the strategic work I'm doing with clients, is that a lot of community professionals simply aren't ready for these forces at the moment. It's almost like we're kayaking backwards into them. And before we begin, before we begin explaining what these forces are and examining their impact, I think we have to think about how the community model works. When we think about success, we think about some very specific things. And the way we're looking at this for some of our client work at the moment is that there's kind of this inner circle, right? It varies by different kinds of organizations, but most communities, or at the very least, most brand communities, want some combination of these things. They want engagement, often sadly, just for the sake of engagement. I'm not personally a big fan of that, but I know a lot of people like it. They want customer support. They use communities as a customer support tool. They use community as a customer success tool where people will share advice and knowledge and expertise with one another. They use it as an innovation tool where they can identify exactly what their audience wants. They might use it as an advocacy tool, maybe as a retention tool or customer loyalty lo 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 tool. And what we try to do with a lot of our clients is benchmark on a scale of good to bad with a simple traffic-like system, how they're doing with each of these goals at the moment. And what we find, and this is pretty tip, typical at the moment, is usually brands are pretty good at engagement and customer support, but in almost of the, any of the other dimensions, they're not doing that well. Let me ask you a question. Which of these is most important for you right now, today? If you were to guess, or if you had to tell me which of these are most important to you, what would it be? Which of these goals matter the most to you? When we evaluate any of these things with clients, we look to see the level that it is at the moment and then which direction it's going as well. Well, we have a lot of engagement, advocacy, success, some combinations, engagement, success. Wow. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, so a wide variety of different things. And what we tend to find is that these results are generally influenced by your strategy, right? Every one of us are hopefully has a strategy for our community in some form. If not, you should definitely get in touch with us as soon as possible. But hopefully every one of us has a strategy at this point. And the strategy is often some combination of these things. It varies, but it's usually a combination of the technology stack. What platform will you use? How will you configure that platform to have the biggest impact? It will be your acquisition, onboarding. How do you attract people to visit your community? How do you get them up to speed? How do you retain them in that community? It will be how you manage that community. What are your policies on moderation? How are you going to initiate discussions? What kind of contents, events, and activities are you going to host? It will be how you nurture your top members in that community. And then it will be the benefits you offer as well. And the results that inner circle is dictated largely by that outer circle. This is what we call the community experience. It's all these things where someone visits your community in whatever form that may take. It's all these things that are going to be influencing these kind of uh, factors. So if, how, how you configure these things, the benefits, top member programs, technology acquisition, this is going to determine what kind of um, goals you're going to get and how successful they're going to be. But one of the things we're ignoring, and we see this so often, is that the prevailing forces around the environment you're in are critical to the, the success of your community. And if your strategy or if any of the activities you engage with in go against these outer forces, that strategy is not going to succeed. And time and time and time and time and time again, we see strategies which are dead on arrival because they're going against the prevailing forces of the industries they're in. And I think there's five forces at work here. One is support versus pressure. The degree to which your organization supports you against the degree it pressures you to deliver results. One is push versus pull. This is the degree to which you have to push your community upon someone versus degree, the degree to which it pulls them in. Another is the audience. How challenging or easy are they to engage? How demanding are they? Are you, are you dealing with one homogenous audience or that all have the same needs and the same goals? Or are you dealing with an audience that has different languages, different parts of the world, different technology, different technologies that have some very specific needs? And then there's risk versus exploration. To what degree is your organization happy to just explore and adapt and evolve as you go versus the degree to which they are worried about the risks of what might happen? And I think depending upon the organization you work with, there's going to be a completely different degree of risk versus exploration here. And then there's competition. To what degree is the sector you're in or the benefits you're offering your members competitive versus uncompetitive? And all of these things create an environment. And I think a lot of people that take success for their communities at the moment often have the good fortune to be in the right kind of environment. You see at the scale at the bottom left here, it's toxic versus fertile. Some environments are very easy to build a community in. They're very fertile grounds to build a community in. Other environments are very risk averse, highly competitive with low support, and it's much harder to build a community in these sectors. And what we're seeing at the moment is that these five forces here are changing in a way which they weren't before the pandemic. I think the pandemic has had a big impact on all of these five forces, and it's going to have a big impact upon the level of participation that I like to get and every single strategy that you might deploy to get the results you want. And sometimes you get to choose the environment. Sometimes in your, strat your strategy, you get to choose a very fertile environment to build your community of in. Sometimes you get to navigate your strategy to be as optimal as possible for a community to thrive. And sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes the environment chooses you and you have to work within that environment. And we've looked at all the different uh, factors in online communities. We've studied so many online communities, collected so much data over the years. And what we found and it's really surprised me, is that there's one predictor of a successful online community. Out of all the data points we have access to, one thing is more predictive of a successful community than any other. Would any of you like to guess what that is? You can put your answer in the chat box again. What do you think? Out of all the different metrics we might be studying, what do you think is the biggest predictor of a successful community? 
Authentic relationships, mm, it's hard to put that in a metric. Positioning is not a metric. Uh, clear why is not a metric. Come on, folks, we're talking about a metric here, a specific metric. Someone says engagement. Engagement is more of an outcome. Active members, visits, retention, nope. Every single one of you is wrong at this point. Number of answers, nope. Think about a, le a leading metric, not the outcome, but the leading metric. Number of questions is an outcome acquisition number. Some of you are kind of tiptoeing around the edge of the answer here. So let me tell you, out of all the metrics we've looked at that will determine how much engagement you're likely to get, and we've looked at many, the number one thing is the level of search traffic you get in the first place. What you can, or what you can kind of see in this graph at the moment is the average number of Google searches for a brand name and then the level number of active users within that community. And what you see, the correlation isn't 100%, it's not a clear one, but it is very highly predictive of how many people are likely to be participating in that community. And we see this over and over again. And what this means is that around 45% of the var variability of your success can be determined right from the beginning by the number of Google searches that you get the number of Google searches that your brand gets, the number of people that will be visiting your community in the first place, the number of people that are interested in your topic. And this is just one of the many, many ways that the environment you're in has a huge impact on the level of success you're likely to experience. And when we talk about all these five forces, there's one takeaway I want you to remember here. One takeaway that goes that is true for all of these five forces. And I don't want you to forget this, which is go with the flow. When community strategies fail, is when they try going against the tide, when they try going counter towards the, these forces, when they're in an environment where they think they're going to get more support and they don't have that support, when they're in a sector that is in decline and they're trying to turn that around, when they're trying to persuade members and other people to do things that they don't want to do. And one of the reasons when we look at our client work and the successes we've had over the years, what we find is that all of these are based upon a very simple ex um, experience of going with the flow. If we look at uh, this case study we published on CMX um, a couple of weeks ago, every single thing we do in our strategy is about going with the flow. It's about understanding what members want, what they need, what the environment is telling us, and then going with that flow. And we try to be really, really good about going with that flow. Because two things we know are extremely difficult, persuasion and behavior change. Here's a question for you, and I'm wondering how many of you can answer it within, say, 30 seconds. What was the last thing that you changed your mind about? I'm going to give you 30 seconds to try and put an answer in the chat box. What was the last thing you changed your mind about? Someone said going to Vegas next week. <laughs> what I ate for breakfast. Okay, let's, let me caveat that important things, you know, not just drinking more, more water or what kind of eggs you, oh, wow. Okay, you folks have taken this in a very different direction. <laughs> what was the last important thing that you changed your mind about? To purchase a camper? <laughs> I think the reason why it's difficult to answer a question like this is that we don't change our minds about things that often. And that means that persuasion is really difficult. To persuade them want someone to change their behavior is really difficult. This photo is from Australia just over a year ago. And literally, if this photo doesn't persuade people that climate change is a problem that needs to be solved, it doesn't, it doesn't make any of us change our ways. It's, not, it's gonna be really hard to persuade people to do anything. None, none of us are looking at this photo right now and thinking, wow, you know what? I should fly less. And I think persuasion and behavior change are incredibly hard to do. And the more we go against that, the more we're going to be struggling about, um, the more we try to base our strategies on, on persuasion and behavior change, the more difficult it's going to be to make the strategy work. And it's a lot easier to go with the flow. So what we're going to cover is what each of these five forces are and how then we can deploy them in our community. One of the biggest forces I'm seeing at the moment is rising pressure. I think a lot of people think at the moment is that there's rising support for communities and there's some degree of this, and there's definitely some degree of this, 
but rising pressure is by far the biggest thing that's taken place. I think if you get more support, there's more pressure. And what we see is that it's generally a process that communities go through. where looking at an axis of the budget and perceived results. What we tend to see is that some communities in an organization context are generally too small to really care about. If the budget for an organization is say 150K or less a year, generally for a large brand, and for, for small brands, it's very different, but for large brands, it's too small to care about. And then we see there are some communities with the million dollar plus budgets that are generally at the indispensable level. We know with some of our clients or some of the big blue chip com companies are other day, these communities are indispensable. They are uh, very expensive. There's big investments that have been made in them. And I think a lot of communities are in danger are those in the middle. What we see in a lot of them, what we saw during the pandemic is that when times get tight, when budgets are relatively restricted, and it's usually at that 150K to 1 million a year level, this is the community kill zone. This is where communities tend to be cut. This is where you have to progress through this stage really quickly. And so a lot of people think that having a greater budget is a good thing, and it is, but it means you have to very rapidly progress through this stage. And obviously it's not just about the budget, it's about the perceived results as well. Because if you're too slow in this stage, it's very likely your community isn't going to survive. So rising support, I'm not sure that's true. I think there's rising awareness of communities, but I think there's rising pressure as well for communities to deliver results. And what I think that means is that the era of the isolated community is probably coming to an end. Isolated communities will be bypassed or will be, or will be bulldozed. We've all seen these photos of homes that are built on motorways and the motorway go, goes around them. And I've seen that a little bit in communities um, and organizations as well, where someone will launch a community and they'll always want it to be like a separate isolated thing. It will have its own team that's disconnected from the rest of the organization. It will have its own budget disconnected from any other department. It will try and keep other departments at arm's length from that community. And they'll try to stay apart from everything else and not align to the core goals of the organization. And this is a problem. Isolated communities will be by, bypassed or bulldozed. And I think the pressing challenge for all of us right now is definitely to, to think, where does community fit into the bigger picture? And I think a lot of us feel that community is so important and so prevalent and so essential to the, to the success of an organization that it's going to thrive at its own department and, and other features and functions going to pour into that. But honestly, I know many people would disagree here. I don't think that's what's happening. You can look at so many other trends that are taking place at the moment. And what you see is that customer success have stormed past online communities. Why did that happen? Why is customer success more popular than online communities? Online communities are being around for a lot longer. Customer support is more, it gets more search traffic than online communities and brand communities. Gamification, what we often deem as a subsection of communities gets more traffic. Why is that happening? And I think definitely in some organizations, communities are going to become their own thing. Community is often the very reason that the organization exists. But what I think we're seeing more and more is that community is a little bit like video, where it's an approach. It's an approach that serves a higher purpose. And we can fight against that. But I think if we're going with the flow, it's a lot easier to embrace that. Where some organizations will have their own video departments and will have a big criteria for, for video and prioritize video accordingly. But what I think we're seeing is that community is very much its own approach, but it's in service of a higher purpose. And I think there's four general approaches here that seem to be working really well as prime use cases for a community. One of them is where community will satisfy lower budget customers. You see this in a lot of organizations that have um, SaaS companies and many others, where they have different uh, customers at different levels. And if I'm, say, a customer that is spending $100 a year on an organization, and each support call I make costs that organization, say, $15, it doesn't take too many support calls for me to make before I become unprofitable to that organization. But if I can go to a community, if I can ask a question there and get help from another member, that tends to be a very good use case. 
it makes me a lot more profitable. So while the higher budget customers probably always want direct access to a customer service rep, what we're seeing more and more are communities satisfying the needs of what we call lower budget customers, or maybe customers that don't spend as much time or energy with the organization. One of our clients, Geotab, we spent a long time working with them um, a year or so ago to get this community up and running. And it's the same thing. We know that their top customers are always going to want direct access to their support rep. They're paying for that in the contract. But community is a fantastic tool to help thousands of other customers who maybe aren't paying for that, but still need a very high quality support option. That's one of the things we've seen again and again and again. Another one is where community generates unique marketing assets. This is more of a rare use case, but it's one of those ones where a lot of communities that we're focusing upon engagement are shifting towards. We spent around a year working with the Sephora online community, completely redeveloping their community strategy from scratch. One that has focused upon engagement and belonging and all these kind of things, to one that's focused on generating these amazing marketing assets. And what you see in the community at the moment is that the content from the community is now featured on the product pages as well. Reviews are sourced to the product pages. So when you're looking for a product on Sephora, you're going to see content from the community. You're going to see content from the community of marketing campaigns. And what's really important about this is that it doesn't matter now how much engagement you're getting because engagement overall isn't sustainable. At some point, you're going to reach a peak and then you're going to struggle. But once you align to something bigger, something better, something that's more valuable to the organization, then that community is going to thrive. And so we're seeing more and more of this where community can be used to generate unique marketing assets that are indispensable. Another one is where community becomes a base camp for success. And this is especially true for newcomers to the brand or the organization. If you want to get a newcomer up to speed very quickly, time and time again, we're seeing that a community is a fantastic tool for that. You see it with say the digital ocean community. If you're, if you're, if you're a, deve a developer involved with, di with DigitalOcean, then this is a fantastic community to visit. But well, it's more of a base camp that's gonna help you see all of the tutorials, all of the questions, the latest talks and resources, all in one place. This is a fantastic tool for a community. Uh, OutSystems, another great example. They redid their homepage a while back, and now it's fantastic. And what do you notice about this? Again, it's all of the information you need in one place. It's your forums, your documentation, your training, your events. It's all connected and it's all in one place. Again, a fantastic tool, a fantastic approach as well. And the last one, and I think a trend we're going to see more and more, is where community is woven into the fabric of that entire experience of being a member or being a customer. We see this with the relaunch of the Salesforce community recently, where they have woven community into the fabric of training and support and documentation and everything. It's now that something that goes alongside everything else rather than its own destination. And this might be where a lot more brands go in the long term, but I think we're seeing is that one of these four approaches is gonna be a good fit for around 80% of you on this um, process right now. And so what I'm going to try and do with each one of these is show you what isolation, uh, what um, going against the flow and going with the flow looks like. If you want to remain as an isolated community, you're always going to be fighting the tide. You're always going to be fighting for more support, budget resources. But if you go with the flow, if you integrate, that's the approach that makes sense. Force number two is convenience. What we're seeing is that in the past, a lot of people thought their members wanted a great sense of belonging. And what we find is what members actually want is information that's convenient to them. <laughs> Originally, this photo was a person sitting on the, on, on, on the toilet with their phone. I decided to change that at the last minute because I felt the graphics might not quite work. But I think the point is that people want information that's convenient to them. Convenience is one of the most important things that people want. And again and again, we feel like um, members want a sense of belonging, but the data simply doesn't support it. Believe me, I've done hundreds of surveys with different organizations over the last decade. Not once, not once have I ever, in any way that we word the question or structure the question, had a sense of belonging or support or making connections come anywhere near the top. In fact, in most brand communities, it's a very last option by some way. But quality of information, getting good answers, getting answers in a convenient way, that is the most important thing to most members today. 
And I think what we saw a while ago was that there's this trend for these mobile first approaches to community. And we noticed that mobile first peaked, but believe me, it was never mo mobile first. Mobile first was never the point. It was convenience first. And when mobile was the most convenient tool, that was the approach that we took. And we need to think for everything we do, how do we make our communities more convenient? And there's so many ways we can do that. One of the ones I would recommend is to structure your taxonomy by the topics, not intent. Very often, I think we try to be too clever with the taxonomy. And sometimes it works, but very often it just doesn't. When people think about the answer they, that they want, there's certain terms and terminology that they use and they're familiar with. And our communities have to be centered around that. Our communities have to be centered around what members actually want. So Clarice, another client of ours, um, we didn't work on this, but the idea of engaged and ideas and groups isn't how people think. I think Fitbit and that kind of taxonomy approach where people search by the product, that's probably going to be more successful in the long term. And we're seeing this again and again. That's why I like communities like UiPath, for example. Is it the most attractive online community out there today? And I don't know if anyone from UiPath is here today. And if you are, I apologize. But no, it's ugly. But if you are visiting this community, how easy is it from this one page here to immediately find what you want? I really like this page, not because it's beautiful, but because it's, it's a beautiful experience for members that try to navigate through it. One of the things we should be measuring is the effort score. Very often with communities, we measure the, the NPS score, but NPS is a measure of advocacy. And it's not appropriate for a lot of the communities out there today. If your community isn't trying to drive advocacy, then why would you measure the net promoter score? But the effort score, the level of convenience of, um, that reflects the convenience of your community, that's going to be far more important. Because once you know what your current effort score is, then you can start measuring that. And that's where you can start looking at doing things that have a huge impact that we don't talk about that often. And one of the most important things I'd recommend you do is archive your old content and discussions. If you've got content and discussions to get less than 10 visits in the past month or less than two posts in the past year, then you can remove these from search results. And the clever thing here is that members still keep their points. They still get um, all the benefits and the badges and rewards they've earned, but they don't show up anywhere else. And it makes it a lot easier to navigate around your community. So, whoops, give members what they want, but just be aware you can't please everyone. And very often you have to think about what do members actually want? Take the Airbnb community, for example. Airbnb gets a lot of um, recognition for their community, but honestly, and I'll get in trouble for this, I'm sure, I don't think their community is that good. I think this idea that people want to join a global community of hosts simply isn't true. And if they change this to focus on, say, boost your host rating, that community would absolutely thrive. It'd be far more active, far more engaged, and they'd have far more people participating. So very often, we just have to align our uh, community and our approach and our communications with what the audience actually want rather than what we think they want. So going against the tide here is forcing people to become friends. Going with the flow is focusing on the convenient way for your members to solve their problems today. Okay, force number three out of five, declining reach. I think declining reach is one of those hidden things that doesn't get anywhere near the level of attention that it should be. And I think it's hidden. A lot of us work for organizations that are growing and so more people naturally visit the community. But what we don't see is that our reach is declining. Generally speaking, communities always need a fresh supply of members to survive. I think we all know this, that no one is gonna be in a community forever. So communities need a fresh supply of members to survive. And if you're working for a top brand that's growing, then you have these constant new source of customers coming in. But if you're not, if you're working with a mature um, organization that isn't growing or you're in a topic that isn't growing, then you're going to notice certain things happening. And I think these are one of the things that's hidden at the moment. What we know for most online communities is that search generates more than 50% of traffic. If you are a public community today, search might generate um, up to, what, what's the bottom graph say, 82, 83%. But generally with a lot of mature communities, around 50% plus is quite common. 
And it's amazing actually how common that 50% plus um, metric actually is. These are two different client communities at the moment. And it's remarkable how similar, sorry, three different client communities at the moment. And it's remarkable how similar two of them are today. But the danger here is that the gatekeepers that have been giving us all this free traffic over the years, they're beginning to close the gates. And I think one of the best examples is Google at the moment today. It's subtle, but what we're starting to see is that Google is sending less and less traffic to branded communities. If you look at the work of Rand Fishkin at Spark Toro, you'll notice when you look at the data is that Google is sending less and less traffic to brand communities. And I don't think we've really noticed that at the moment, but this trend is likely to continue. Another thing, Facebook, if you're still getting traffic from Facebook and still relying on Facebook groups, the organic reach is declining and it continues to decline. Do any of you even remember when organic reach of a Facebook page was over 15%? Do you remember those days where everyone was saying, hey, we should close down our brand community and move it all to a Facebook page? And then what did Facebook do? They began closing the gates. They began charging people to reach their own audience. And so what we're seeing is that reach on almost all channels is likely to decline. One of the other trends, which is either good or bad, depending upon your perspective, is that Google and other search engines are taking the answers from your community and putting them directly into search results so then people don't even have to click on the link. So Google is keeping more and more search traffic for itself. And on one level, this is great. It's easier for members to get the answer without even having to visit your community. That's fine. I mean, it's not great for your engagement metrics, but it's the same result. What it also means is that there's less people, less people that are going to be visiting your community now, less people like, that are likely to, to become top members. It's less people that are asking questions, which means fewer questions that are going to be asked and less search traffic in the long term. So we have to think about how these trends are going to affect us. Take email. A lot of your emails and promotional messages that are going out today are going into a promotions folder. Even people that have subscribed and said they want to receive these messages, these messages are going to a promotions folder with all the other spam that is out there at the moment. And I think this means that your open rates are probably going to decline. And I think less people are going to become more, more people are going to become more difficult to reach by email. Your newsletters are going to be less effective than what they were before. And it's very hard, harder than ever, to get members to visit a private community. One of the hardest things for any community builder to create today is a private community. Because private means you don't get any search traffic at all. Private means you have to remind people all the time to visit that community. Private means that the community isn't in the flow of what people do. And we often see, if we use a, sim a, sim a similar graph to before, that the level of behavior change is very difficult. If you want to change the behavior of members, then you need more and more persuasion, the more, um, the greater the degree of behavior change you want. And this is why most brand communities are based around customer support, because the behavior change isn't that high. People have questions, they need answers to those questions, and you give them a place to ask those questions. And the personal benefit is also, isn't huge, but it's easy enough. But once you go into a success community, where you want people to share their long form advice with one another, why would they do that? What's in it for them? When you want people to read documentation and articles in a community, that's a lot more difficult. So support communities are really difficult, I mean, are really easy to do. Uh, private communities can work, and we'll come to that in a second, but success communities are struggling. And I think if you're developing a community solely around success, where people are going to share best practice with one another, that's going to be a challenge you have to solve. So let's talk about private communities for a second. Private communities are always a challenge because they're private and it's very hard to get people to visit. And if we look at some of the private communities that are successful, like, y like YPO, what do you think makes YPO a success when many communities have failed? And all you need to do is read this homepage here today. Why do you think YPO succeeds when many other types of communities fails? If you want people to visit a private community and become a member of the private community, you have to offer a tremendous benefit to them and it has to be authentic. 
What do you think YPO is doing here? Let me give you another 10 seconds. Applying for membership, yes. Status, exclusivity, yes, that's it. Private communities more and more are going to have to rely upon exclusivity. But this creates a challenge where if you want a very busy private community, you can't have a very exclusive private community. So I think private communities that are just for our customers, they're going to be more and more difficult to pull off. And I'm really trying to recommend most clients don't try and create a private community for their customers. Sure, you can have an exclusive community for your best customers and do events and um, special things for them. But just a private community is going to be difficult to pull off. And it means you have to be authentic in your approach. Take socialmedia.org. Take maybe 30 seconds just to read this home, this home, this home page here. What do you notice about this page? What do you notice about this page here today? Let me give you around 30 seconds for this. White space is inviting. Yeah, I'm not talking so much about that design, but yeah, I suppose the white space. Yes, clear purpose, right? A clear benefit. Very little branding, list of companies that are involved. And it's very clear, this is just the A's, right? These are, these are only the companies beginning with A. What else do we, do we notice? The value is clearly articulated, no, no vendors. And if you are at this level, what would it say? We ask hard questions. It's the fastest way for busy leaders to get answers. You notice how clear this is. And this isn't just a fib. I've had um, other people try to join this, this community and being rejected. And, the, and I think this is going to be a future for a lot of private, private communities, in which they're going to have to become more exclusive and more specific and really identify what members want if you're going to get people to visit. Because getting around that declining reach is going to be a challenge. And I think more and more we need to prepare for this world of declining reach. And I think it's going to mean for a lot of us, we need to dig our own wells which we can't be reliant upon Facebook or Google to just open and send all this fresh source of traffic all our way. We're going to have to get better at digging our own wells for different types of traffic. One of the really interesting things recently um, is I've been looking at private online communities on Facebook. And most people, I think most of us today, have this almost snobby attitude about Facebook or a moral um, issue with using Facebook, and I understand that. Uh, but when we look at how many successful private groups are on there, if we look at the, den the dentistry space, for example, and I've been working with um, Invisalign on this, what you notice looking at some of their competitors is that they've got a lot of successful prior private groups that are out there today. You've got groups that have um, 7,000 members and they're active or 45,000 members and they're active. So that might be one well that we, we might want to dig to get people to visit our community, having a private group or a private outpost like this because it's in the flow of when members are already going. Another example is cognitive search. If you don't know what cognitive search, go to Covio or the Logitech community, which means that when people visit a company homepage of any brand and they search for information, your community should show up as possible answers there if it's relevant to the query. Very often it doesn't happen. The community product is disconnected from any other search tool which means that all these great questions and answers and information people are providing in a community simply isn't showing up for people that are searching for information and it might benefit the most on that brand page. But if you use a single cognitive search tool or a federated search tool, what you can find is that it will retrieve information from the community, from discussions, from anywhere else and prioritize it for that member. That means it's in the flow of where members already visit today. Another one is working with um, a um, organization called US Pharmacopia. I've been working with them to get the new community, a very private, exclusive online community off the ground, just for people in a specific med medical field. And what we had was a launch, and then it kind of stalled a bit while we tested different things to figure out what worked and what didn't. And then we stumbled upon one tactic, which more than any other tactic I've seen, drove a lot of people to visit that community. And if you're in the social media space, you probably know it already, but my colleague Nifa, or my colleague, the person I'm working with, Nifa, began promoting discussions on, on LinkedIn and using the Canva app to share discussions and activities. 
and as short videos. And what we notice here is that this drove an absolute surge of new signups. It's been something that's absolutely changed the uh, game for us. And what you notice for each of these videos, okay, they're getting 800 views, 900 views, 1500 views, which isn't huge. But if you think about it, if only 10% of them want to join and participate or 1% of them want to join and participate, it's a sustainable source of new traffic over the long term. And we're seeing LinkedIn, especially interesting enough, being a very good source of new traffic to a lot of the more private exclusive communities at the moment. And we're seeing this more and more, um, even I'm finding when I post resources on LinkedIn, that we're getting a lot more views than what I'm getting even on my blog or any other channel, which is very surprising. But one other thing I've noticed is that the messaging matters a lot. If you want a, a discussion to spread and get attention, if you want content to spread and get attention, that the language you use is really important. Because we're finding more and more that people share content that supports their view. And obviously there's a lot of dark psychological arts around this. Um, you can get as deep into that as you like. But we're finding that if I just post this, um, this, um, this image here, and say, this is a timeline for a successful community launch, I'm guessing it would get a fraction of the views are saying, experienced community professionals know the real work of building a community begins months or even years before you launch the community. Because that's a message that people want to share. And more and more we're finding that you have to be really careful about the um, wording that you use if you want a message to spread. And obviously you can go overboard here, but I'm betting that a lot of people saw this and thought, I'm an, experienced I'm an experienced community professional, I'm going to share this. And so it depends how deep you want to go in this, but just posting a discussion or content isn't enough. We're finding the message has a big impact on how many people would like to share it. And what I think we'd like to see is that acquisition plans are going to have to change almost every year. If you're relying upon um, search and uh, direct traffic, that's gonna work. We have to think more and more, how do you get your community into the flow of where members already visit today. Because it's gonna be very difficult to persuade people to visit your community. It's a lot easier to get your community in the flow of where members visit today. Force number four is a declining tolerance for risk. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I think there used to be a time not too long ago where executives would suddenly be surprised to discover they had a community that someone in the organization had created a community. Um, I think it was um, two years ago, I was at a event and I met, um, I think it was the VP of, of marketing. Um, and he was, he was surprised that there was a community, that his brand had a, a community. And that was interesting for two reasons. One is that he didn't know this was a really big deal for us. And two, the event that he was at was the launch event for the community. So I don't even know how he was at the event. But it used to be a common situation where executives would suddenly be surprised to discover they had a community. I don't think that happens anymore. Um, or at least I hope it doesn't happen anymore. I think more and more executives think of a community a little bit like the, the kayaker here, where the community is a shark and the executives in that kayak trying to stay afloat, where there could be an issue here if something isn't addressed. And so I think the tolerance for risk has declined dramatically as people have become more aware of some of the challenges and some of the risks that a community create. Well, let me ask you, because I think risk is one of these things that don't come up that often. What risks do you think a community creates for an, or an organization? If your brand has launched a community, what are the risks? I'll give you maybe 30 seconds or a minute on this. What do we have? Piper says bad reviews, innovation. I don't think in, in innovation is a risk. Legal, reputational. Okay, but be, be more specific. What kind of legal or reputational risks? Uh, Rex says time people spend away from work. That's an interesting one. For us, we have fears that people will say negative things about our product. Yes, that comes up again and again. Losing trust with customers. Uh, what else do we have? Um, the original version to social media that it started, um, employees had no idea until it overtook them. Embarrassment, yes. Product um, liability, yes. Uh, people feel they can't control the community. I love some of these. Uh, people sharing content, that's an IP concern. Flame wars, yeah, there's a lot of this. Building a toxic community. 
if we can't publicly admit we have a bug or it's broken, yeah, Dennis, that is a very common one. Imagine if someone raises an issue, but you're not allowed to respond to it because of legal concerns. That's a big challenge, especially in um, the, pharm the pharmaceutical space and a lot of tech companies that are publicly traded as well. Yeah, a lot of very common, <laughs> we don't have to imagine, yeah. So what we're seeing, as some of you mentioned, is that the risks tend to fall into five categories here. One is like the reputational risk, people will say or do something bad. Two is the legal risks, where there'll be a risk that um, because of something in the community, you might be li liable for what happens. Um, harm to members. If you're in a community and someone shares bad advice and other members act on that bad advice, sometimes you're protected, sometimes you're not. Harm to staff, um, I don't want to belabor this one, but if you're in a certain kind of gaming online community, then a risk to you personally is one that is tragically there. Um, and then just the risk that the community will fail as well. And I think the way to overcome this is to become more risk averse than they are. When we go wrong, it's when we try to persuade executives that communities aren't risky. And I don't know about you, but I haven't found that approach works. Because the more you say the word risk, the more risky that thing becomes. I think that's true of almost anything. So instead of trying to pretend the community isn't risky, it's easier to take their view and say, yeah, it's risky. So let's develop a full mitigation plan for this. And you can find a link and get access to the template mit mitigation plan we have here. But there are risks and we can't pretend they're not there. It's easier to go with the flow here. So it's easier to accept that there are risks and we have to have a mitigation plan in place for every single risk. And now you can engage all of your stakeholders in creating this. So then they feel more confident that, okay, there is a risk in this, but there's also a risk of, of hosting an event when someone might trip over and injure themselves. There's a risk in pretty much anything. But so we don't want to pretend a community isn't risky, but we can plan for a risk. We can engage other people in that risk. We can do these things that make it more likely that people are going to get behind us. Okay, force number five, rising competition. Rising competition, I think, is another one that doesn't get much attention, but I think it's the thing we're gonna see an impact sooner rather than later. I went through so many photos of cats against bears before I, I, got, I found one that I liked. And even then I wasn't allowed to use it because of the photo right, the photo copy, copyright issues. So eventually I found a dog. What I mean here is, don't fight losing battles. Like we don't want to be in a position where our communities are competing against competitors that have more resources than what we do, that are more aligned with the trends of what members um, than we are, that can deliver a better user experience than what we can. That's a losing battle. And what we're seeing more and more is that all of the benefits of a community are starting to be salami sliced away from a lot of different channels that people can use. We worked for a long time with the HP community, for example. And if you're in the HP community and you have a question about a printer, well, you can use a diagnostic tool they have. You can use the chat box. You can phone customer support. Why would you visit the community? Why would you visit the community? And so I think more and more, and the challenge facing a lot of us is positioning the community in exactly the right way. Because far too often, the positioning for a lot of communities are like this where maybe you want trustworthy answers and personalization. And sure, a community, yeah, it's kind of trustworthy. It's kind of personalized to you. But if that's what you want, if that's what a customer wants, if that's what a member wants, then surely it makes far more sense to call customer support because it does both things better than a community. And so the challenge is how do we make our community better positioned to thrive? A community can't compete on scales like this so where can a community compete? And what I think, as I've talked about before, is convenience. I think there's other tools like social media and maybe subreddits that people visit every single day and it's very convenient for them to use them. But then you're not going to get very trustworthy responses. And sure, you can phone customer support, but it's kind of a pain to ring someone up and to wait for a response. And community, I think, more and more is um, succeeding that scale. And maybe the works for you, maybe it doesn't. But the positioning and your communication has to reflect that. And far too often, we don't spend anywhere near enough time on the positioning of a community. Even if we're doing a private exclusive community, we don't spend enough time on this. Or when we do, 
we try to communicate every possible benefit that a member might possibly want. So we have situations like, this is a real example from another client. Community is an exclusive group dedicated to empowering leaders by sharing world-class expertise, exchanging insights and revamping industry best practices. We change this to a private place to solve your toughest problems. Which of these do you think is most persuasive to you? Is it even close? And I think it's a lot easier to find the one thing that your members most care about and optimize for that. The one thing that doesn't put you against any of your competitors today. The one thing that's gonna give you this open space where you can grow and develop because the competition is very real and it's something we really have to deal with. And what we're seeing again is like, even the competition for top members of top experts is important. One of the great things you should spend your time doing is looking at the gaming communities that are out there today. And we noticed that gamers are often very far ahead of other sectors and things like streaming and things like how top members build their audiences are very well developed in some sectors. And one of the challenges for a lot of brand communities is that they want the top experts participating in their community. But if you're a top expert in a field, then what is the one thing you want? Is to build a following that you control. To build a following on Twitter or Twitch or any of the platforms that make sense to you. YouTube perhaps, because then you have control over that audience. Or Medium or blog, because then maybe you can monetize it at some point. And more and more, I think we're going to have to, if we want top experts participating, is to reach out to them and have them engage with the community, but also help them build their following as well. Maybe you're going to list the top experts in your community and help um, other newcomers to follow that. Because then those people are going to be very highly engaged in your community. And we found that to be a very effective approach for engaging a lot of top experts. Another thing you might want to consider doing is being the launchpad for the entire ecosystem that's out there today. If you look at what AWS are doing, AWS, their forums, if I'm going to be honest, are pretty bad. But what they're very good at doing is saying, hey, this is the springboard for where you want to go. Stack Overflow does a better job on it than our forums do, so you might want to visit there. You might want to go to the subreddit. You might want to go to another place. You might want to connect with the top experts. And I think a lot of brands, if they want to go with the flow, are going to have to start doing this as well. So fighting against the flow will be competing against bigger budgets, but going with the flow is finding that unique positioning and then incorporating that as well. And what we can do here is take all these factors into the final complete will of where we are today and what we need to do. If you only want to take one screenshot of this entire session, then this is it. This is, I think, the key things that we need to do in our strategies today for our communities to really, really thrive. Because right now, there's far too many communities with strategies that are dead on arrival. Far too many communities with strategies that are too reliant upon persuasion or big aspects of behavior, of behavior change. And we need to change that. And I think a lot of communities are moving from a very fertile space to a more toxic place. And I think we need to shift where we're heading towards and heading towards that more fertile ground where we're aligned with where the trends are in our industry at the moment today. Because what we know is that there are some strategies which won't work well in the new era. If you're trying to launch a private community but have no existing audience to promote it to, that's going to be a challenge. If you're trying to have a big public um, community that's fully reliant upon search, in the future, that's going to be a challenge. And so we're going to have to think about how these broader factors, these big environmental factors, are going to have to be embraced by our strategies in that new era of building a community. Because ultimately, what we want to be doing with everything we do is going with the flow, not fighting the trends at the moment. Because if we get this right, and we're seeing time and time and time and time again with all of our clients, if we get this right, our communities will thrive and we'll be building the kind of communities that our members need and deserve and are in line with what they truly, truly want. So if you want to learn more about me, go to Phoebe.com at Rich Millington. Um, also, we have this huge number of resources at Phoebe.com slash build your community. You can get access to lots of templates and resources that we're using that can help you navigate around these trends at the moment. And finally, if you want to do me a huge favor and you want to learn a lot about how to navigate the new era of building communities, then please buy my book on Amazon, Build Your Community. Um, and if you buy it this week and send me proof, you get access to the accelerator tool that we've created as well. 
just send the receipt to richard at feedby.com. And if you already have the book, The Wire, by the way, and really want to help me out, then please leave a review on it on Amazon. Um, apparently, it's a big, important thing that you have to have, so please leave a review. Okay, that was a huge amount of information. I hope you found some of it quite useful. Um, if you have any questions, I've got a minute or two to spare, or like three, three, three minutes to spare. So maybe I can take one or two questions by uh, chat. Um, and thank you so, so much for all of the participation, the thoughts, the support, um, and all those things. Thank you so, so much. Okay, any questions? <laughs> Thank you so, so much for all of your kind comments and words. They're like, I really appreciate it. I spent so much time work, work, working on this this week as well. Okay, I'm trying to, if you're moving away from a brand community, do you need to start again? Um, do you show that's, I don't know. I'll be honest, like it's quite a specific one to go with um probably yeah um i can't think of a situation where you'd be moving away from a brand community but yeah will we get access to the slides yes i'll send the slides and the recording out um of course thank you uh martin can i book you for a private session um <laughs> yeah um yeah just reach out to richard at feedweed.com and you know hopefully we can make that work uh latika private session booking yeah hopefully we can make that work uh mark uh, looking forward to reading book. Thank you. Um, Shannon says, do you have resources for non-brand communities? Um, yeah, a lot of the content at the moment is targeted towards brand communities because frankly, that's what pays the bills for me. Um, but I would say if you go to thievery.com, a lot of the resources aren't specifically for brands. Like that's the best use case and the most common example. Um, so yeah, we can definitely make that work. Um, so it just turns out. Vienna, what's the best way to stay updated on trends from competitors? Um, oh, that's a huge topic. Join their online communities. It's the most important thing. See where the data is going, scrape that data. If you reach out to me after this, then yeah, I can help. Lan says, you suggested that going against the tide will cause failure. Not always, but yeah, it's, it's, it's going to make it more, cha more challenging for you. But don't you have to go against the tide to differentiate and innovate? Yeah, this is a fantastic question. Yeah, at some point, you're going to have to go against the tide for sure. Like otherwise your community would already exist, right? And there'd be no need for it. But what I would say is go against it as little as you possibly need to do. Like often you need one specific thing that goes against the tide, then everything else is about capturing the value of that community. So great question and a really great point. Uh, Alejandro, how to satisfy low budget customers and stay exclusive at the same time? Um, yeah, I mean, I posted a blog post in this, um, I think last week or this week, where you can see the different levels. So I'd recommend visiting that. Um, sorry, I'm really running out of time here because I've got a hard stop in like uh, one minute. Uh, Simon, how much do you think it's worth investing in SEO? Um, yeah, a lot. There's, um, it's worth spending maybe 10 grand or so if you can, just investing in SEO, getting an SEO consultant to make some recommendations and act on it. Past that, there's kind of a law on diminishing returns here. Um, thank you so much for some of these questions. Um, doo -doo -doo. What's the best place to search for community manager jobs? Um, yeah, C CMX is good. Um, uh, community roundtable is good. Uh, Comsoy is good. Um, maybe someone could put the links in chat as well. Um, I'm trying to skim through the last questions we have here. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, I think I covered them. Uh, Tracy, does excessive safety restrict community growth? It does to agree, but you've got to figure out how to work around that. Um, you don't want to be too cautious for sure, um, but you've got to work within the outlines you have. And beyond a certain level, you have to say it's not possible to build a community in this domain. Um, so yeah, when I've got another client call, I have to drop on, jump onto right now, but I just want to say thank you so, so much for your time. It's been amazing. I appreciate all your contributions and questions, and I'll send the recording out as soon as I can. Thank you so, so much, everyone. It's been fantastic to um, have this session with you today and speak to you soon. Bye.